Hi, everyone. I'm Chris Lazarus, and today I'll be talking about some of the work that I did over the course of my PhD. The title of my dissertation is Trustworthy Machine Learning by Efficiently Verifying Compressed Models. I know the title is a little bit long, but as this talk goes on, we will cover each of those elements. This work mostly covers stuff related to automated decision making. Driving around in the Bay Area, or just generally in 2022, we all have seen what many people call AI, and what I would more specifically call machine learning based systems become more and more ubiquitous. Of course, machine learning is enabling new technologies such as autonomous vehicles, among many others, to flourish. However, with their pervasive apps comes a lot of challenges. Almost weekly, we see headlines about catastrophic failures of the systems. And one of the main reasons why this happens is because it is very hard to assess if a machine learning system can be trusted. Among many of the problems that come with machine learning and more specifically neural networks, comes the issue with perturbation robustness. What this means, or an example to illustrate that is, uh, a model that was trained to classify images um, correctly classifies this image that I think we humans can agree is a panda as a panda. However, when we add a tiny bit of noise, as small as we can see there, it erroneously classifies it, that, that basically has no meaning at all. It very confidently classifies it as a gibbon. I think we can all agree that this is not a gibbon, and what this shows is that state-of-the-art model, models are vulnerable to perturbations. Another issue that we can encounter is adversarial inputs. Adversarial inputs are changes to inputs that are crafted in a way such that the models uh, produce the wrong output. One example is this. On the left, we can see what we can agree is a, I hope we agree is a traffic light and the system correctly classifies the traffic light. But by just adding those 11 white pixels that are in the second image, it's, it's hard to observe, but I think you can appreciate that. We get this resulting image that the system then erroneously classifies as an up. Imagine if an autonomous car or another safety critical system was using this kind of model and it didn't correctly identify a traffic light as a traffic light, it could lead to catastrophic consequences. So for sure problems can take place in the real world. Another kind of system that we're interested on are mission critical systems. This is a running example that we will, using, uh, we will be using for some of our benchmarks. And so I think it's worth spending a little bit of time introducing it, but it's the ACAS-XU uh, Airborne Collisional Avoidance System. This version of the system is specifically designed for uh, unmanned air vehicles with drones. But at a high level, the idea of the system is that as the airspace becomes more and more densely used, which means that for the same volume of air, more and more vehicles are used nowadays than in the past, we want to equip um, Air, uh, air vehicles with a system that helps them avoid collisions. Uh, traditionally, um, or, or more, more like traditionally, historically in the 80s, uh, there was a, a previous system called TICAS that nowadays commercial aircraft have that helps them avoid collisions. And this new version of the system incorporates some other complexities such as having both horizontal and vertical advisory. And the way the system works is that it takes um, as input some of the variables that describe the scenario um, for a given configuration of aircraft. And so we have our own aircraft that we call the own ship, and we consider another air uh, aircraft that in this case we call the intruder. And we know the relative heading of the aircraft, the relative speed, uh, you know, the altitude, um, the relative distance. And depending on this different circumstances, we want to produce an output um, to the own ship of whether there is no conflict, which we label COC here, that stands for clear of conflict, or whether the ownership should make a, sl a slight bank left or right, or a strong bank left or right. This problem was originally solved actually in work by, I think, Michael, uh, Michael Kokunder from my advisor, but recent work by one of my former colleagues in the lab um, approximated this solution using a neural network. Turns out that this solution in simulation uh, appears to perform even better than the exact solution. However, I think it would be really hard for either us, at least for me, or for any regulator to trust a system that was built using training for which we have uh, no guarantees about the safety um, that it will induce in the, in the aircraft. So with these examples, what I am trying to motivate is a key question that has guided my work over these past years. And it is, how do we guarantee safety? I think if we want to fulfill all of the what some people call the promise of artificial intelligence, and I prefer to say machine learning, uh, or at least to be able to take advantage of some of these modern uh, models that we're able to use for many different tasks, we need to find ways to guarantee that they will induce safe behavior for any application that is safety or mission critical. I personally think most of the applications that are actually impactful and involve human beings, 
or any cyber physical application uh, is of this type where we have to guarantee feedback. All right, so this talk will be structured in the following way. First, uh, I'll talk a little bit about, about the background uh, because I think we need to have some ideas in mind uh, for, before we delve into, into the meat of the talk. I will talk about the concept of neural network verification. I will show some of the challenges that it poses. Later, I will talk about efficient verification of a different kind of network that are binary neural networks, which I will also introduce. And then by the end, I will show how the combination of binarized neural networks and deep reinforcement learning can allow uh, efficient end-to-end -end verifiable machine learning for autonomous systems. At the end, I'll summarize um, my contributions and discuss potential avenues for, for future work. All right, so with that, let's get to it and start with the background. Um, as I said, there's a few concepts that we have to have in mind before we delve into the main topic of the stock. And those topics are mostly neural network or deep learning and formal methods. So, this might be a little redundant, but I just want to make sure we're talking about the same thing. And so um, this work pertains to neural networks, which are a sequence of affine mappings. Um, basically, we have an input vector x, and the whole network maps it to the output y. We call the network f here. And at each layer, we apply, uh, we have that the network is made up of a sequence of layers. The output of the previous layer, or, or one layer we denote with z, and the input of the next layer, layer z i. And so each layer is composed of an affine transformation that is characterized by a matrix and a bias vector, followed by a nonlinearity, sigma i. And by composing this set of layers, we're able to build uh, deep neural networks, which have been shown to be extremely useful for many different tasks. And so it's a composition of multiple layers. And here we're just describing what that looks like. And as we know, there is a nonlinearity, which is what makes them powerful, but also makes the problems that we have to deal with pretty hard. And in this talk, we will mostly focus on uh, the rectified linear unit activation function, which looks um, as what I'm just displaying on the right of the screen. But it's good to keep in mind that most of the method, methods I'll discuss here can easily be extended to arbitrary piecewise linear functions. All right. The other idea that we should uh, have in mind is that of formal verification. So formal verification is a subfield of computer science uh, that is concerned with given a computer program, so we can basically think of traditional code that an uh, engineer wrote, and a set of specifications that usually are uh, take the form of a precondition and a postcondition or some invariants. So we have a computer program and, an, and a specification, and we want to make sure whether this computer program upholds that specification. So an example of this would be, we want to make sure that whenever we uh, use a calculator. If the input is one plus one, the output will always be two. I mean, this is a fairly, um, I, I'd say trivial example, but we can imagine much more complicated things, uh, perhaps uh, talking about like navigation systems or, or, or systems that deal with clinical um, settings or other things. Anyways, the, in formal verification, there are many methods to either given this computer program and that specification, confirm whether the specification is upheld or um, uh, demonstrate that it's not. And very often the way uh, we prove that a specification is not, uh, doesn't hold is by providing a counter example. The high level idea of most of my work, the stuff I'll be talking about today is to bring this level of formality and this level of rigor um, to modern machine learning. And so the idea is that instead of a computer program that was crafted by a software engineer, we will have a computer program represented by a deep uh, neural network and a specification instead of being a set of preconditions and postconditions we will have regions of the input space of the network and regions of the output space of the network and then we will want to make sure whether this network satisfies that specification or provide a counter example that demonstrates otherwise now with these uh, ideas in mind we can get uh, to the main part of the stock before that i'll just outline my contributions throughout my phd I would briefly, or at a high level, summarize them into three categories, uh, neural network verification, runtime safety assurance, and efficient verification. So for runtime safety assurance, even though it relates to this topic, I will not be covering that uh, in this talk in the interest of time. And for neural network verification, I would break uh, my contributions into two main things. And the first one is I joined a team led by Guy Katz and Michael and Professor Clark Barrett, among many other people, and contributed uh, to the second version of the Reluplex algorithm, which is original work by Guy Katz and, and other colleagues. 
And this is basically an extension of what I would think is still the state of the art algorithm for neural network verification. And my contributions are listed there. And then the other one uh, for general neural network verification is I collaborated uh, in a project led by Chang Yu Lu, where we wrote a survey paper and an accompanying um, software library that implements more than 15 different verification algorithms. And we basically provided a proposed a taxonomy for how the algorithms can be classified and also ran a bunch of different performance um, benchmarks and try to basically survey the, the landscape of what the state of, of the current uh, verification problem is. As we will see briefly, neural network verification is a very hard problem. And so I think if we want to be able to verify uh, machine learned or machine learning systems uh, before we use them, I think we need to consider the fact that we want to verify them when we are designing the machine learning model itself. And so I believe in doing this and I will show it in fact thus, um, using simpler models can lead to more efficient verification. And uh, I will cover this later on, but the main idea behind is that we use simpler models by binarizing the networks and then simple mixed integer programming approaches help to, to solve these problems. Okay, so now I will formally specify what neural network verification is. So we can think, um, in order to think of what precisely neural network verification is, we can look at an image like this, which is basically an example output slice of the ACAS uh, model I described there earlier. And we could we want to make sure that imagine, you know, we have in this image uh, our own aircraft that's heading to the right and the intruder aircraft that's heading to the left. And we basically want to make sure that if our two aircraft are not in collision course, there should never be a warning, right? So we can do this, of course, by sampling a bunch of points in the input and just checking whether those points that correspond to different scenarios of their configurations of the aircraft lead to the desirable outputs. The issue, however, is that if we zoom in really closely, yes, I'm, I'm trying to demonstrate in this figure, we can see that in between the samples, there's a lot of empty space. And so in fact, um, because networks are able to operate, I mean, of course there is, you know, it's overflowing point, but uh, theoretically we train networks to operate over uh, RN. And so there's an uncountably large number of samples that we could fit into a network. And so just by sampling points, we could be missing uh, what could be uh, uh, a catastrophic outcome, right? So it could be the case that it's somewhere in between those points there is um, um, input that leads to an undesirable output. And moreover, uh, there's a lot of work that shows that networks are very prone to very sharp discontinuities. And as I showed earlier, they're also um, uh, su susceptible to adversarial attacks. So the mental picture that I like to have in mind when I think about neur neural network verification is that instead of thinking of um, sampling a bunch of points, and then checking if they're of the right color of the right output that we're looking for, we want to build something that looks like this, which is we really want to fill in all the gaps. And the way we do this is not by sampling a bunch of points, but rather by reasoning about the computer program that the network implements. And we'll, we'll see uh, in a bit how, how we do it. So formally, the way we define this problem is for a given network here, uh, we call the, the function that the network implements NN of X we define a subset of the input space, big X, and a subset of the output space, big Y. And we want to see whether the network maps that subset X to a subset of Y. So pictorically, it looks like this. And the question we're trying to answer is, is it the case that for every point in our set X, the image of that set through the network belongs to the output set? And so intuitively, or, or I guess at a, at a first glance, it might appear like this is a very specific kind of property that we're trying to assess. But in reality, many different interesting um, or consequential safety properties that we might want to inspect for uh, neural network-based systems can be represented in this ways. Of course, there are situations where it's really hard to reason about what the sets of interest are, for example, in image space. But in other cases, like the running example we've been looking at uh, about the collision avoidance system, one can pretty easily craft um, regions of the input space and that we know what the desirable output should, should look like. Okay, so to illustrate, uh, or in order to provide more background about uh, what the neural network verification landscape looks like, 
I'm going to present some of the ideas behind the current approach to solving this problem. And in order to do that, I'm going to present part of the work uh, that I did, and as I said, was led by Chang Lu, uh, which is a survey paper uh, where we implemented more than 15 algorithms, uh, different algorithms for verification. And um, given that this is a fairly complicated problem, I'll actually later uh, give a brief sketch idea of why this is an NP-hard problem. There are many different approaches. And so um, I will cover at a high level what these different approaches are, but the first thing that I want to convey in order for, for the rest of the talk to, to make sense is that um, based on how the different algorithms work, their outputs can be slightly different. And so the first kind of output that we can see is what I discussed earlier when I was motivating or presenting formal methods, which is counter examples. Even a set X in the network, can we either show that the set maps all of the, uh, the network maps all of the set X to Y, or a way to disprove this is to provide a counter example. These algorithms tend to be, in principle, have to exhaust a lot of, have to search really large spaces. The benefit is that the counter example uh, they provide is a certificate that the property doesn't hold. And they tend to have a property that we call completeness, which is um, all the algorithms we'll talk about are sound. And what that means is if a property doesn't hold, they will all say that it doesn't hold. But because some of the algorithms, as we will see, use some sort of kind of approximation or more specifically over approximation, some of the algorithms will sometimes falsely say that a property doesn't hold. So that we call incomplete. However, most of the algorithms that return the counterexample failure mode are called complete. Another kind of output that we can get is pertains to adversarial inputs. So if you remember the slide that I showed first where we slightly perturb the image of the panda, uh, this kind of algorithm basically, the way, what you feed, the way you specify a property is you select a, a, set, a point in the input space and a radius. In this case, the point uh, is called the x zero and the radius epsilon. And then we check whether every point that for a given metric, let's say in this case, we're using a P norm, uh, after you map it through the network, does it lead to the subset of interest Y? Many times, these kinds of algorithms actually return the largest possible epsilon, which means how strong of a perturbation can the network um, sustain for a given point and still lead to the desirable output? Another kind of failure mode is to compute the reachable sets. And I will go into more detail soon, but the idea is that rather than just seeing whether the network actually maps the set X to the set Y, we actually keep track of what happens to the set X as it's propagated forward through the layers of the network. And we ideally try to return our representation in the final layer and then see whether this representation is a subset of the set why these methods tend to be more efficient but are also incomplete okay so now that we've seen that there's many different kinds of failure modes i want to briefly discuss that there's different kinds of um, approaches and so of course each algorithm has its own specific details and implementational uh, optimizations but the idea here is in this work we provided a proposed a way to classify the algorithm, so a kind of taxonomy. And the way we did this was by considering the kinds of approaches that they use. So the first broad category of algorithms that we covered, uh, we call reachability. And so I was, as I was saying earlier, the way this works is, imagine that we begin with an input set X that here we can, we can see which corresponds to the blue square. And after we apply the first affine transformation, uh, you know, this basically looks like a rotation or reflection and a translation. Uh, we end up with what looks as there as the second square. And then after we apply the first set of um, activation functions, which as I said earlier, we are restricting our attention to ReLUs, we have a set that looks like that. Again, we apply another affine transformation and makes the set look like this. And finally, we apply uh, another set of activation functions. And so our set in the end looks like that uh, kind of small, interesting, weird looking blue set. And then we would only look at this set and, and compare it to the set of interest that we had and say, oh, this is a reachable set for, for that set X. And we can compare this to the uh, set of interest that we have. Of course, keeping track of these sets uh, 
you know, for, for a low dimensional example like this one where we have two dimensions looks relatively simple. Of course, uh, the whole point of using neural networks is that we can deal with really high dimensional problems such as images and so on. And so keeping track of, of the sets uh, for each layer is a very computationally demanding uh, task, both computationally and uh, both in terms of compute and memory. And so very often what these methods do is that they rely on over approximation. And so actually some of the fastest methods that we have uh, seen use this kind of approach. However, because they use over approximation, I mean, they preserve soundness, but they lose uh, completeness. Another kind of approach uh, where we broadly categorize the algorithms is opti, the ones that use optimization. And so the idea behind this is that we, um, different algorithms use different objective functions and actually some of the algorithms don't even really care about the objective function, but rather whether there can be a feasible assignment to the constraint. And what happens is that we uh, basically encode all the equations that govern uh, the flow of information through the network. So we basically set up all the equations that represent uh, the connections between one layer and the next. And we um, encode all of those as constraints of the optimization problem. And so if we are able to find a feasible assignment to, oh, and, and, and one more thing, we, we have also equations that correspond to the input uh, nodes. And by putting constraints on those uh, variables, we can specify the input set. And then by putting constraints on the output variables, we can encode the output set that we're interested. One trick that uh, we do here is that we complement the output set. And so what we do is we encode in the variables that correspond to the output layer, the complement of the prop of the set Y that we're interested in. And so that means that if we do a type of search uh, that provides a certificate of completeness and we find no solution to this problem, it means that we have we can certify that no point in the set X leads to the set Y because all of them lead to uh, because none of them lead to the complement of Y, right? And so the main issue with this is that, as I said earlier, with with ReLUs and uh, ReLUs basically would require thinking or encoding some sort of uh, disjunction, which which would basically also make uh, the problem non-convex. And so a lot of some of the approaches work by uh, relaxing the ReLU into what would be lead to uh, convex representation. And that can be achieved using triangle relaxation. Other approaches use parallel relaxation. And another approach that I actually will revisit later uses mixed integer encoding. Of course, the issue is that when we do this, uh, we often have to deal with uh, way more complicated, um, com computationally more costly problems to solve. But um, Many of these algorithms actually attain a fairly decent performance. Of course, again, the ones that rely on over approximation, such as triangle relaxation or parallel relaxation, um, are again incomplete. Another kind of approach uh, that we uh, identified for the different algorithms is using search techniques. And so, search, uh, I guess the name says it by itself, but it basically entails looking over a space to try and find a solution or more precisely a counterexample. If the search procedure is exhaustive and we have to look for every possible counterexample and we couldn't find one, it means that we can certify that the property holds. And so search can happen in two different spaces. One is in function space. And so the idea is if we, uh, we can think of each, in this case, because we're only looking at values, we can just think of each node with an activation function is either active which we represent with a zero in this image or inactive with, uh, sorry, inactive with a zero or active with a one. And so if we ahead of time knew whether each node was active or inactive, we could represent the whole sequence of layers as a compos composition of a set of affine transformations. And that's an affine transformation itself. And then the problem would boil down to having kind of like a simplex feasibility problem, which is basically the first step that um, some like, you know, the simplex algorithm does. And so, we're basically, in this case, we can think of this as searching in function space. So basically we are assigning whether a, a, a ReLU is active or inactive, and then we're searching in that, which we call activation pattern. So if we have N ReLUs, we can represent this space as a string, uh, a binary string with N digits. Another space uh, where we could search for um, 
um, counterexamples is in uh, the input or hidden domains, which are basically the outputs of uh, intermediate layers. And the way this works is basically by thinking of something similar to branch and bound. So imagine we are looking for a counterexample and we keep, um, because uh, networks that have relative activation functions are piecewise linear, so they're like high dimensional polytopes, uh, we can, looking at the slopes of, of these faces of the function, we can discard parts of the function, like half spaces. And so the idea is that by doing some bookkeeping and a branch and bound approach, we can look uh, for one of these um, uh, counterexamples. Out of all of these algorithms, the one that I will present in more detail is Reloplex, which is actually the original work by Guy Katz and uh, also led by Michael here and Clark Barrett. And so the ideas um, behind Reloplex, I will revisit later uh, because they will uh, serve as background and motivation for, for the approach that I later uh, present myself. So um, with all of these different algorithms I've covered, uh, of course, we want to compare them and we actually do in order to assess their performance. So I want to briefly introduce two of the um, typical benchmarks that we use and that we also are seeing other people use. So the first one, we go back to the example, uh, our uh, running example that we've been using about the collision avoidance systems. We have a network that implements a controller that helps uh, aircraft avoid near meter collisions. It's about, has about, each network has about five to seven uh, outputs, uh, inputs, uh, sorry, inputs, and it outputs uh, five different things, uh, no conflict or uh, weak turn to one side or strong turn to, to one side. And so here, uh, some of the properties are actually, or, or some of the properties that still the community is using to benchmark their algorithms come from the original Reloplex paper where they introduced around 10 properties that they verified. And so these networks are, I believe, publicly accessible. And so people have been using these networks to benchmark their algorithms. And so this kind of property I would call safety property. But another really interesting and, and very popular thing to study, perhaps not necessarily from the verification uh, approach, but rather from the adversarial robustness approach is we look at networks. Uh, let's think of a classification network. So we, a, a very typical hello world example in deep learning would be to train a classifier to learn how to classify images of handwritten digits. So there's this very popular data set where it's fairly easy to train a network that is able to identify its handwritten digits. And the idea here would be for a digit that we know its correct label. So imagine that we're looking at a number three right there. How much can we perturb this number three before the, the network incorrectly classifies it? And this is what people call adver um, perturbation robustness or adversarial defense. This whole uh, kind of problem it's also addressed by a whole other set of techniques that deal more with statistical or geometric properties of the network. But in this case, we continue to think of robustness as a formal guarantee. It's not a statistical assessment, it is a formal guarantee. So with these two benchmarks, we ran them, uh, or at least we tried to over all the different algorithms we've covered. And I know there's a fairly dense slide, but the key idea that I want to convey here is that so verification is a very uh, difficult or computationally costly problem. In fact, if we take a quick look at this table, we can see that most of the algorithms timed out. And out of those algorithms, basically all of the complete algorithms timed out, except for Reloplex, which is part of the reason why I'm going to revisit it later. But um, as we can see, um, and, and, and notice that these plots are in log scale. It's, it takes a really long time to verify properties. And it's mostly only the incomplete algorithms that are able to verify most of the properties before um, um, uh, we, you know, they hit our, our time limit. And so because of this, and I think Reloplex or the new version of Marabu is still the state of the art algorithm, I'm going to spend a little bit of time discussing how it works. And then uh, with that in mind, we will be able to, to talk about how the algorithm that I propose works because it's fairly similar. Okay, so 
Earlier, we talked about optimization algorithms and search algorithms. And the way uh, Reluplex works is by combining those two techniques. And the idea, I, I almost covered this earlier, but is if we knew ahead of time whether uh, Relu is active or inactive, and we fix it to be active or inactive, then the equations that govern the flow of information in the network at that node would be basically the ones, just the linear equations. And so we basically keep track of a search tree where we specify whether um, uh, a node is active or inactive. And in doing so, um, for each of those, we have a set of different equations. In each of these equations, because we're using the optimization approach, correspond to a linear program that we have to solve. And we try to solve it for each of these. And if, if we find a counterexample, we're done. But if we don't, we potentially have to traverse this whole tree. And the issue is that if we have n nodes, this can mean that uh, in the end, each node can be active or inactive. We could potentially have to solve two to the n linear programs. Of course, solving a linear program by itself is already a, a costly problem, but this just illustrates how um, this problem is NP-hard. Uh, and this is actually proved uh, in the Reluplex paper. Um, and so, because this problem is really hard, uh, I collaborated in the new version that is, uh, called Marabu, and the first idea, uh, it brings significant improvements in performance. And the first idea that was introduced and that I worked on is uh, to parallelize the problem. And one way is to split up the input space, and then you can process each region of the input space separately, and in doing so have uh, performance gains. Of course, it's not trivial to decide how to split the uh, input space. And so one way to do this is by briefly uh, kind of uh, uh, doing a first phase where we sample points in the input space to try to identify regions of the input space where the activation patterns vary a lot. And that can guide uh, the way the input space is split uh, to uh, minimize uh, the runtime. One second. Another of the uh, improvements that this version of the algorithm has is that it has network level reasoning. And more specifically, that means bound propagation. So the idea is, if we have um, each set in the input layer is basically often specified by having bounds on the nodes, right? So we could think of uh, an, a property of interest could be that one of the nodes, as we see in this image, is between one and ten, and the other between one and two. And obviously, as we look at the weight um, of the network uh, at each layer, we can propagate those bounds, and we can normally do it naively as is shown here. But if we use, um, let's say, symbolic algebra, or we reason about this more carefully, we can end up with way tighter bounds. And so we can see that on the left, we have a bound for the output that is between minus 19 and 11, and on the other one, minus nine and one. And this is similar to what reachability algorithms do, but the gains here come from the fact that if we know that one specific node is the input to one specific node is either always positive or negative then we can basically fix that node to be either active or inactive in which case we can prune uh branches of the of the function space search tree that i was discussing earlier which can provide very significant uh reductions in in runtime another of the uh, improvements of this uh, library is that it has um it's, a, it's a basically the engineering or the software aspect to it which basically now incorporates uh, tens, uh, support for uh, directly ingesting TensorFlow networks in the form of protobuffers, and it now has a Python API. Whereas before uh, with Reluplex, basically the user would have to write their own uh, kind of main and recompile the program. Uh, and now it can be easily imported uh, and interact with some of the popular contemporary computational graph um, uh, frameworks such as TensorFlow. So, now that we've talked about neural letter verification, I'd say that the main ideas or takeaways that, that uh, I want you to have is that um, there is a trade-off between completeness uh, and performance. So complete algorithms are very computationally costly. Overall, neural letter verification is very costly and challenging. And even for the benchmarks that, we, uh, that I've described earlier and the ones that we use in the survey paper, we often actually use um, kind of artificially small networks. So for the tasks that we're solving, we use networks that do not attain the state of the art, but rather we 
limit how complex or big they can be so that we can still use our algorithms to, to test them. And so currently, I would say even the most uh, uh, performing algorithms, the best performing algorithms still do not scale to what I would call like real life size networks. And so with that, I think um, what I brought up earlier is we should definitely, if we're going to be working on a problem that is safety or mission critical, we should consider from the start that the models we are training uh, should we, we should bake or, or infuse the need of verification into the designing uh, of the of the models we use. And so, one at a high level, the idea is if we use simple models, they should be easier to verify. There's many way of simplifying models, and the one that I propose and tested is to compress them by quantizing them. So for this, uh, I use binarized neural networks. And so basically binarized neural networks are very similar to traditional um, uh, neural networks. The only thing is that instead of letting uh, their parameters take on any floating point value, uh, in principle, we quantize them. So that means we let them take on values from a discrete set. The most extreme quantization scheme is binarization, where we basically represent each of the parameters of the network with a single bit. So you could think of this as a one and a zero. In practice, we use one and minus one, which is the same thing. And then if we want to keep all of the arithmetics of the network binarized throughout every layer, then we also need to replace the activation functions to make sure that the output of one layer is also either one or minus one for each uh, dimension. And so a way to do this is to use the sign function. And here, I just want to make sure it's sign means signum a trigonometric sign. And so comparing these two things looks kind of like the figure that I'm showing here, where you know instead of being able to approximate, uh, instead of having uh, smooth or piecewise activation functions, we basically use the sign activation function. And another cool um, benefit as shown in, in this uh, important paper in the field is that um, binarized neural networks um, using the sign activation function can be mapped uh, each each operation. So you're basically doing the dot product between two vectors that have only ones and minus ones for entries and then taking the sign of that. So this is basically doing the XNOR bit count of those two vectors. And these networks, of course, um, are way harder to train. Uh, I mean, the benefit, as I said, and as I show here is that the whole network can be um, mapped to kind of like a CNF, a conjunctive normal form, which means that it can be implemented using um, a collection of logic gates. Uh, of course, these networks are harder to train. Uh, there are some tricks to do that. I will not do it in, in the interest of time. But most of the interest in these models came from uh, having to use or implement networks in uh, memory, uh, energy, and uh, time constrained settings. So basically, for edge devices such as phones, uh, we do not want to use a lot of uh, CPU cycles uh, to draw inference, or we also don't want to consume a lot of energy. So there's specialized hardware that enables the implementation of the net these networks. And that has motivated a lot of the work uh, that has basically shown how to train these models. It turns out very simple tricks uh, and still using gradient descent surprisingly works, even though in principle, this approach completely changes the optimization landscape, right? I mean, we're no longer dealing in principle or at least theoretically with a smooth optimization landscape that we can just navigate using um, gradient descent, but rather we are actually dealing with a combinatorial problem, uh, but surprisingly these uh, networks still work. And so actually we'll see in a bit how well they work or not, but the motivation to use them for this purpose, which is to make verification easier is this. So if we revisit what we discussed about Marabu or Reluplex, we have this tree in uh, for each node in this tree, we in principle have to solve one linear program that can lead to a huge amount of linear problem uh, programming problems that we have to solve. And the idea is that if we used um, binarized networks, instead of having to solve a large sequence of linear programs, we can solve one single pretty large mixed interior programming problem. Um, this happens, and of course I won't cover the details in this talk, but because uh, all of the parameters of the network are zero and one, and instead of ReLUs, we have um, um, sign functions, 
we can represent all of this using uh, mixed interior programming. I want to make it clear there's other work that has used this approach of mixed interior programming for neural net, uh, full position neural networks. However, here uh, it appears that because of the structure, because of because the design matrix of the mixed interior program only takes minus ones and ones, it appears to lead to um, to require very few uh, pivoting steps, which means um, numerical accuracy is preserved throughout the runtime of the MIP solver. And so with that, uh, we were able to show that um, this is a promising approach. And so just to give you, give you an idea, uh, for the task that I described earlier, the uh, hundreds and digit classification models, if we basically train very simple models with no fancy data augmentation, nothing just off the shelf models, it's fairly easy to get a 98.2% uh, classification accuracy uh, with a deep neural network. And if we switch the deep neural network for a binarized neural network, we basically sacrifice a little bit of performance, understandably, right? We're using a way simpler model, but the decrease in performance is fairly small. If we go from 98.2 to 95.6, so that's pretty small, but in exchange, we gain significant improvements in verification runtime. And so the idea is uh, if you just compare uh, all of the green bars with the blue bars, we can see that uh, for a tiny trade-off in performance, we had a significant gain in uh, runtime reduction. And, and so the point is not necessarily that we are in a rush or we want to be able to verify properties really fast, but the idea is that if this is the case, then we are able to verify larger and larger networks. And so with this, uh, the idea is binarized neural networks um, actually can solve uh, similar uh, tasks with very similar performance to full precision networks. Yes, they are harder to train. It requires a lot more of hyperparameter tuning and so on. Um, but with a tiny um, bit in performance degradation, we can verify them at the very uh, uh, very quickly compared to their full precision counterparts. And this basically suggests that if we have settings uh, that are uh, mission, we're, we're training a mission critical system, we can perhaps consider using binarized neural networks uh, to solve uh, those problems, and uh, that can lead to efficiently verifiable uh, models. Um, now, uh, now that we have shown that binarized neural networks can exhibit similar performance and can be verified efficiently, uh, I've wanted to get back to one of the topics that first interested me in my PhD, and, and that is reinforcement learning, and show how we can use binarized neural networks in reinforcement learning to um, solve some of the bench uh, typical problems and still uh, preserve uh, verifiability. So just a quick, uh, very brief overview of reinforcement learning uh, is basically it's, um, so basically in reinforcement learning, we uh, have to make a sequence of decisions uh, and we want to optimize a long-term uh, reward. And so the way we, we think of this is we have an agent, which is basically uh, controlled by the policy that we're training at each time step, the agent performs an action here, we call that u sub t. And then that basically changes the world or the environment. And so, from the state that we previously had, which was s of t, we get a new state s of t plus one and a observer reward of t plus one. And the goal is to maximize the uh, uh, long-term uh, uh, or the total expected uh, reward or discounted reward. And solving a reinforcement learning problem corresponds to finding a policy that basically for any state, it gives you, it prescribes what action to take. I, with this notation, it means that it's, for a given state, it gives you a probability distribution of what the optimal action to take. Um, turns out that very recently, actually, I would say some of the work that has reignited and perhaps fueled all of this new um, advances in what people call AI is combining this framework. Uh, and, and, and let me just be a little bit more formal. In this case, we're trying to solve a market decision process where the transition function is unknown. And so, we learn by trial and error, hence the name reinforcement learning. And the way we do that is that we approximate, I mean, in the case of deep reinforcement learning, there's different approaches, but in the typical uh, kind of vanilla version, we approximate this policy using uh, neural network. And that is called value or state uh, value function approximation or uh, state action uh, 
uh, value function approximation. And again, uh, it has been shown that when we use neural networks, we can attain very impressive performance and even outperform humans for many tasks. But then we have the same issue where this is a black box. It's really hard to trust it. It's really hard to deploy it in mission critical or safety critical settings. And so again, I uh, proposed uh, that, okay, why don't, uh, you know, if we, if this black box is made up of a traditional deep neural network, it's going to be really hard to verify it. We're going to run into the same issues that I discussed before. So why don't we try solving this same problem uh, with a binarized neural network? As we have seen, uh, it's, uh, it appears that it's easier to, to verify those. So instead of using a, a deep neural network, we use a binarized neural network. And so I don't have time to go over the details of how to do this, but I basically um, adapted the deep Q learning that is a algorithm, which is a well-known algorithm in, uh, for deep reinforcement learning by making some changes uh, that you can take a look at in, in the paper. Uh, we were able, so if we just binarize, um, if we train a, a network using deep Q learning, and then we just binarize, so basically we apply the sign function to a network, the performance drops significantly. I will show that soon. And so we modify the algorithm in order to train a network that is binarized, uh, rather than just binarizing an already trained network. This is something that, by the way, I didn't mention before, but not only for reinforcement learning, you could even think of binarizing a network. You could, you know, for a classification problem, you could have a network that's already trained and then just binarize its parameters. If you do that, uh, performance decreases significantly. So the better way of training a network is to use BNN specific uh, training procedures. And so here we basically propose that honestly fairly simple uh, and surprisingly well performing approach uh, to train uh, binary neural networks in a deep Q learning like uh, fashion. And so we ran this and we use the typical uh, and lovely uh, benchmarks uh, that you know are the Atari games, which is something I really like because it gives me the excuse to talk about video games in my dissertation defense, which is I think something that's pretty cool. Um, but I guess it's really hard to draw any clear conclusions from this. So, Let's remove the ones uh, that basically have the most variance and just focus on, on some of them. I mean, this pattern, uh, you can go back and take a look at this pattern holds even for those. But so here, what we have is four different Atari games and we are uh, showing their normalized scores. We're for every game normalizing with respect to the DQN performance, which is, I would say the off the shelf, um, well-performing deep reinforcement learning algorithm. Of course, there's way fancier methods that perform better. Uh, but um, uh, we're not covering those here. So we compare the performance of our random number generator, which basically takes random actions. Um, a human in green, the deep Q learning models in yellow, which by which we normalize all of the other ones. And then in red, it, we basically take the deep Q learning models and just binarize them. And we can see already that it really affects performance. And then in purple, we have our binarized Q learning network of the same size, the meaning same architecture, same amount of layers and hidden um, nodes than the deep Q learning model. And we can see that, yeah, it's, you know, there's sometimes a very big drop in performance, but it's still relatively well-performing. Uh, I mean, definitely better than our random actions. But then when we still have a binarized network, but we let it be bigger by adding more layers, which is plotted in gray, we can see that the normalized uh, average scores are almost the same. And so again, we see the same uh, pattern that we saw back with the classification problem where we are trading off a tiny bit of performance and in return, we are gaining uh, uh, verifiability. So basically, previously, uh, we, we specified for, for the Atari games, uh, a bunch of different robustness problems. So you know, uh, for a known frame of the game or actually the input of this network corresponds to four frames, but for a point in the input space and uh, perturbation, we were trying to assess uh, the um, robustness of the network. So whether perturbing this uh, frame of the game would lead to a different action. So uh, for the DQN uh, networks, we basically were unable to verify any of the properties. And this doesn't mean they didn't hold it. Our algorithms did not terminate. Whereas um, for our BQN that has uh, at the rightmost of, of this plot, it definitely has worse performance, but we were able to verify up to 78% of the, of the properties we were interested on. And then in between where we have our relatively well-performing BQN large network, we were able to verify 
about 50% of the property. So this means we sacrifice again, we want a simpler model. Of course, that leads to slightly worse performance. And I would say it's pretty marginally slightly worse. And in exchange, uh, we gain verifiability. And so the takeaways of this is yes, uh, training binary neural networks is way harder. Uh, on, we observe between five and 12% uh, performance degradation with networks that are up to 31 times smaller. But uh, we can also see that binary neural networks can be used for verifiable reinforcement learning. And so these ideas can hopefully lead to kind of end to end verifiable uh, reinforcement learning. So, with that, we come to the end of the talk, and I'll just briefly summarize the topics that I've covered. And so, at the very start, I've motivated uh, why safety is important for many of the applications that we are nowadays using modern machine learning or neural networks how safety can be addressed in many of the problems uh, by using verification. So where we define an input and output space and how some of the existing approaches work and why this is a very challenging problem. And it is so challenging that uh, we're having a really hard time verifying some of the safety properties of real life size networks. And so to address that, I propose the use of binarized networks, which are basically networks uh, whose parameters are representable by a single bit and whose activation, whose outputs of intermediate layers are also most most parameters, by the way, there are some high uh, position parameters. And then these networks are, of course, simpler. So the idea is that because they're simpler, they would be easier to verify. Of course, I showed, uh, you know, there's a trade off and they perform worse, but slightly, only slightly worse than full position networks. But in exchange, we're able to efficiently verify them. And in doing so, we find a way to incorporate the need to verify networks into the design of the models. And finally, we show that these networks are also um, capable of solving or being used in the deep reinforcement learning setting. And that can lead to uh, kind of verifiable reinforcement learning. And uh, finally, I just want to briefly discuss uh, potential future directions for this research and uh, for research. And so for binary neural networks, I would say that some of the things that are interesting to explore and I would like to explore are to explore other training algorithms. So uh, basically I, I only, I didn't go into details, but you know, it's a completely different optimization landscape. It's a combinatorial problem. I, I just used a standard step through estimators approach. Uh, other architectures could also be interesting and then also other levels of quantization. I think this is the most interesting where if we allow for three levels, we could basically induce sparsity using ternary quantization where we have ones, minus ones, and zeros. And then all the weights of zeros would be like basically removing gates, so making our logic circuit even simpler. Um, for verification of PNNs, uh, basically I just made calls to an uh, off-the-shelf MIP solver. I believe uh, because of the structure of binary neural networks, it would be possible to craft an ad hoc solver that would be able to exploit the structure, perhaps using Perhaps the design matrix are unimodulars. Uh, another thing, but there's work that has explored this actually is to represent the networks as an array of uh, logic gates and use uh, SAT solvers. I, I've seen recent work uh, addressing that. And finally, uh, for reinforcement learning with binary neural networks, I basically only used EQN-like approaches. Where, and I think the first step to complexify this would be to try more complicated DQN approaches, such as double DQN or, or du dueling DQN. And I think it would also be interesting to explore other completely different kinds of reinforcement learning methods, such as the policy gradient family of methods. And also, given that um, these networks are uh, basically parameter, uh, the optimization of these networks can be thought of as a combinatorial problem. I believe there's hope that zeroth order methods, uh, you know, such as a cross entropy method or some population methods, could be used. Um, to train uh, this networks for this problem. So that's it. Thank you so much for your time.